Uh, first off, I'd like to thank the conference organizers for providing me with the opportunity to speak. Uh, also to Dr. Allard for providing a, a good background of permafrost fundamentals that, as I mentioned in my talk last night following Dr. Allard, uh, allows me to freewheel a little bit more and talk about what, what I want to talk about. And uh, I would also uh, acknowledge um, the Department of Industry, Tourism and Investment, uh, which had the foresight to establish a permafrost position with the support of other government of uh, Northwest Territories departments. I've been fortunate uh, to be in that position as permafrost scientist, and I think this has given the territories an opportunity to interface on a technical level with a lot of the partnerships and research uh, opportunities uh, that exist with uh, southern-based uh, scientists coming to the north to, to do work uh, in the north. So, excuse me, the title of my talk is uh, The World of Underground Ice in a Change in Climate. Uh, Chris talked about Dr. Mackay, who I guess we could call the great, great, great grandfather of permafrost science in Canada. Uh, the title of The World of Underground Ice was a paper that Dr. Mackay published in 1972, which is the year I was born. So in the next uh, 15 or 20 minutes, just starting my timer here. David, did I buy myself three minutes there? No. Um, I'm going to talk about uh, ground ice and permafrost. So uh, permafrost is defined by temperature, but it derives its geotechnical and environmental significance from the presence or absence of, of ice in the ground. So we'll talk about some common ground ice types, and then we'll focus a little bit on the implications of the thawing of that ground ice on the landscape. Permafrost, as Dr. Allard pointed out, provides the foundation not only for uh, the ecosystems in the north, it dictates the way that water flows off of the landscape, but also provides the foundation for our infrastructure. So again, our talks today, at least in the morning, are really to provide the context for the more applied uh, discussions we're going to have later in the day. As I mentioned, ground ice is uh, where permafrost derives its geotechnical significance. If ice in permafrost thaws, the ground will subside approximately proportional to the amount of ice in the ground. Uh, we can see we can see in the uh, the figure here we have a, a part of a abandoned uh, road infrastructure near Yellowknife. Uh, without maintenance, uh, thawing of underlying permafrost has caused the road to subside substantially. Uh, we can see the heaving and settlement of the ground can result in the tilting of trees uh, to create the the drunken forest, and we, that tree is has a uh, a lean that's conspicuously similar to the uh, house uh, or building we see here from Dawson uh, just below. So one of the common types of ground ice, it's not particularly spectacular, but uh, it's very important, are, are small segregated ice lenses. And they're almost ubiquitous in the near surface of permafrost where we have fine grained materials. And these ice lenses can form because of the properties of or the character or how water behaves in freezing soils. Not all water freezes at, at zero degrees uh, Celsius. And as temperatures drop, the amount of, of unfrozen water decreases. As the amount decreases, it's held by the soil particles under greater tension. And that induces, uh, basically, water to be pulled from warmer soils into colder soils. As that water moves at a sort of a micro or at a, at a sort of a soil pore level, it will freeze and then form these ice lenses, which can heave the ground surface. This also results in the development of an ice ridge zone, again, as I mentioned, in near surface permafrost. So if we take that soil column where we have an active layer overlain by a, an organic layer uh, and ice ridge permafrost immediately beneath that, if we remove that organic layer and thaw near surface permafrost, will result in surface subsidence. And again, there's many landscape indicators, as Dr. Allard pointed out, for the presence of that, of that ice ridge zone. The development of that ice can cause the ground surface to heave, uh, forming earth hummocks, which many of you who've walked in the tundra or the subarctic boreal forest are familiar with, and that can cause the forest to, to, to lean or heave and lean haphazardly, uh, giving rise to the drunken forest. So forest structure can actually be a very good indicator of underlying ground ice conditions. Ice wedges are another very common form of ground ice that there's a particular uh, concern or significance from a development perspective. Ice wedges form because of thermal contraction cracking of the ground. So when a, when a solid cools uh, and when, when water uh, turns to ice, as it cools below zero, it contracts. 
and to relieve the, uh, the stress from the, uh, from the contraction, fissures can form through the active layer into the permafrost, as indicated in this picture here on, the, on your left-hand side. In the springtime, the snow melt will infiltrate that crack to form a small vein of ice that can extend several meters into the ground. The following spring, active layer will thaw and throughout the summer, and that'll, that'll truncate or thaw that vein of ice up to the surface, but it'll, it'll truncate it at the permafrost table. And the vein of ice will be preserved in permafrost, and over millennia, uh, repetitive cracking can lead to the development of a large body of ice as indicated in that, in that figure. Now, what many of you are, are you're probably familiar seeing uh, is polygonal terrain, which is the surface expression of that, uh, of, of, of ice wedges. And uh, there's a fella in our office who created this three-dimensional image just to give you a sense of what the network of underlying ice might look like uh, beneath poly polygonal terrain. So as you can imagine, uh, because this ice is concentrated immediately beneath the active layer, uh, and because it's, it's actually very spatially uh, discontinuous, uh, it, it can pose significant challenges to linear infrastructure. The third type of ground ice that I'm going to talk about, which will lead into my, the, the last part of my presentation on the implications of landscape thawing, uh, relates to the sort of spectacular bodies of, of massive ground ice that underlay many parts of uh, the North, Northern Northwest Territories. And there, there's a few ideas in terms of how these, land, how these ground ice bodies develop. And I'm just going to touch on those two ideas. One, which, um, which has been forwarded, is that following the deglaciation of, of North America, um, so m much of this landscape, uh, well actually this entire landscape was, was overlain by glacial ice, as the glacier retreated, meltwater was being pushed under the soils, which, which were thawed, uh, towards an aggrading permafrost table, which started to aggrade into the landscape as the glacier retreated. And as the, per as the water reached that freezing front, as permafrost was aggrading, it created a continuous uh, body of, of, of ice in, in many parts of, of the world, and, or of the north. And that, that's one idea that's been forwarded. A second is simply that these large bodies of massive ice are in fact preserved glacial ice. So at the margins of a glacier, uh, materials from the bed of, of, of the, or the, the bed of the ground are incorporated into the uh, glacial ice, um, and the, 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 the snout of the glacier can also bulldoze materials. And then, of course, as the glacier retreats in southern Canada, that ice core, we call those ice core moraines, they would have melted out. They would have had dramatic landscape changes, uh, and moraineal systems occupy much of uh, southern Ontario, Quebec, Michigan. But in the north, as the glacier retreated, permafrost degraded, and it would have preserved that ice beneath a thin veneer of soil. This is, this is one, of, one of the ideas. So what I want to do in this part of the presentation now is talk to you about some of the consequences of the thawing of this mass of ice. And uh, we, we've taken some examples from northwestern uh, NWT. And this work, uh, it involved several collaborators, several universities, uh, as well as government agencies. And it, the work was really stimulated by local observations. Uh, folks from the Mackenzie Delta, uh, Fort McPherson. There's a quote here from Robert Alexi, senior from Fort McPherson, saying the hills are getting messy. And that was Robert's perception of the changes that he was seeing on the landscape. And you can take that as a scientist in passing and go, well, I'm not exactly sure what that means. Well, this is what that means. That is a, a, a thaw slump uh, that is almost a kilometer in, in, uh, in diameter. Uh, and then on the, uh, uh, just up the slope here, we have the Dempster Highway. Um, so that, that slump is, is absolutely enormous. And there's, they've become much more common in, the, uh, in this part of the world. And I'll, t I'll walk you through some of that. So our main research questions were, what are the environmental impacts of these large slumps? Are there more slumps now? And are they bigger than they used to be? What causes these big slumps to form? How come they're so big now and they didn't seem to be as big in the past? And then what are the landscapes that are impacted? Some people might point out that, well, maybe this is sort of a local phenomenon. And actually, it isn't really that important in, in, at, a, at a bigger landscape scale. And we'll address that question as well. So first off, we're going to talk about the life cycle of, of a slump. And I've likened it to, uh, I guess, the, uh, the stages that we will all go through. 
We have birth and initiation. Slumps start from humble beginnings. They, the, the photo I showed you previously looked very impressive, but that slump likely initiated because of the exposure of ground ice at the base of a slope. That could be because of stream erosion, it could be because of coastal erosion or sediment along the shore of a lake. And then, as that ground ice is exposed, it will, it will uh, thaw due to uh, ablation, due to um, solar input, and it sort of chews its way slowly up slope and creates a, a large head wall of exposed ground ice. Those materials fall into the scar zone and then can slowly move down slope by debris flow. And as the uh, head wall is, becomes obscured, as materials accumulate, they can insulate the head wall, the ground ice, and stabilize the, the, the floor of the slump. The slump will revegetate, and then eventually we just have the, uh, the uh, scars of relict or old slumps. What we're seeing in the, particularly in the Peel Plateau is the, the development of enormous slumps. This one here has a head wall of almost uh, 30 meters in height, and we can see the banded mass of ice in the middle of the, of the photo. And then there's just a thin veneer of, of materials on top of that, and those are tills. And the active layer, so that zone that thaws and refreezes every year, that's preserved really in the top sort of 50 to 100 centimeters of the ground surface. So that underlying ice ha is, is basically a part of permafrost and has been so for, for in this case, uh, thousands of years. Another characteristic of these really large features, which is, I think, um, unique, we don't see this, the footprint of these types of, of uh, valley infills other places on the landscape is these huge debris flows that have infilled entire stream valleys. And in this case, this debris flow extends from a thaw slump about two kilometers down a, down a valley. Another unique feature about related to thaw slumps is unlike a landslide, which is sort of an instantaneous event, thaw slumps can live for many, many years. And here we have a, a slump, uh, the same one that I've showed you earlier. It initiated sometime um, before 1954. And over time, it's grown through the 70s uh, to present day, uh, where it, it's almost uh, oh, it's about 60 hectares in area. And just to put it on top of downtown Yellowknife to give you a sense of the magnitude of the disturbance, um, it would occupy most of downtown Yellowknife and extend right down into Old Town. So our focus of work was in the Peel Plateau, and uh, we this, we focused on the Stony Creek watershed, which is just to the north of the Dempster Highway. And we can see the stars in that, in that uh, map there, as well as the red areas, indicate, actually I have a pointer, uh, indicate uh, the uh, distribution of thaw slumps. The red are what we term mega slumps, and it's a bit of an arbitrary distinction, but those are features that are larger than five hectares and have debris flows that connect the valley, uh, sorry, the slope to the valley. And we can see as we move, this orange area is, is morainal deposits, so those are glacial deposits. And as soon as we move into unglaciated terrain, there's an absence of, of, of thaw slumps entirely. And uh, this figure was uh, forwarded to me by Chris Byrne, and it shows quite nicely uh, some slumps here within the uh, glacial limit. And then as soon as we step out of the glacial limit here, we have a, a landscape with very little ground ice and, uh, and no slumps. So the, the community's primary concern regarding these changes, or at least one of the primary concerns, is how does it affect the water? And there, I can say that there's substantial impacts on the water quality. These slumps deliver huge amounts of sediment to the streams. They increase suspended sediment, which is basically the amount of mud in the stream, by 10, 100 fold uh, in these streams. They also affect the chemistry of the streams. The permafrost, uh, when it thaws, it hasn't been previously leached, so it hasn't, the, the materials haven't been weathered, and there's, there's large amounts of different uh, dis materials that can be dissolved and put into streams. In particular, in this part of the world, calcium and sulfate are found in really high concentrations in the permafrost. So you can distinguish runoff from the tundra from the runoff from these disturbances. It's, it's very, very, very different. And uh, this is a, an example here of some of the contrasts. This stream is coming off of unglaciated terrain. And as it flows through the morainal deposits with thaw slumps, uh, we can see this is what the stream water looks like. So this figure here shows on the top water levels in a typical stream in the Peel Plateau. And there's, you can see this, the, the peaks in the, in the water level. And those are the, in response to rainfall. So it rains, the stream rises very quickly. In permafrost areas, streams can respond very quickly to rain because you have an, an impermeable 
layer, essentially, that, that causes water to quickly move into the streams. And then in the, the, here we have turbidity for several streams. Turbidity, again, is a surrogate for how much mud there is in the water. And this line here shows the turbidity levels in an undisturbed stream. So during a rainfall event, the sediment goes up in the stream, and then the sediment supply is exhausted, and then very quickly this turns back into a clear water stream. In the streams that are affected by slumps, we can see this up and down, up and down of the turbidity. The turbidity varies almost by an, an order of magnitude uh, from day to night. And that's because in the daytime, those big bodies of massive ice you see, they thaw, melt water, moves down the slump into the streams and increases the, the suspended sediment in the streams. We also wanted to know how important are these from a large watershed scale. And as I mentioned earlier, sulfate is found in very high concentrations in runoff from slumps. We looked at the Environment Canada record of water quality in the Peel River uh, that goes back to the 1960s. And we looked at the ratio of sulfate to chloride. Sulfate is very different and elevated highly in slump runoff. Chloride is pretty invariant. And we see that in, the in, in that record, the, that ratio or that geochemical indicator increases three, almost threefold over the period of record. The Peel River drains about 70,000 square kilometers. So to have a geochemical response on a watershed of that magnitude means that there's really something significant going on. We could go to, the, uh, to Landsat imagery, uh, which is uh, satellite imagery that goes back to the 80s. And it's, it's very good at detecting changes in vegetation. So once we have these large slumps, the vegetation is removed. And we can look at how the landscape has changed. And this is two images from 2011 and 1985. And we can see all of the thaw slumps in 2011, which were absent from the landscape in 1985. And just for scale, there's a kilometer. So these are, are large, large features. We looked at about 1,500 kilometers of, of, of uh, imagery. And we found a big difference in the landscape through those, between those time periods. The absolute number of slumps increased significantly through the time periods. But what's even more important is that the distribution, the size distribution of slumps has changed. Most of the slumps in the 80s uh, were less than five hectares in area, suggesting that once they got to that size, they typically stabilized. What we see in present day is that the majority of the slumps are actually larger than five to 10 hectares. So essentially, the land just doesn't seem to heal itself. The slumps just continue to grow. They continue to stay in that youthful stage. So we wanted to learn a little bit more about what goes on here. If I could just get Ben to quickly press the video here. Um, we had a couple folks, um, if you just click on it, you should be fine. OK, skip the video. <laughs> I think if you open up the video separately, it, it'll play as well. Um, well, essentially, what that was supposed to show you is the, the magnitude of movement of materials uh, from a slump down slope. And what our data was able to show us, and we, we set up uh, game cameras, and they, they created a time series of, of movement of materials away from, a, away from the slump. And it, it, what it revealed to us is that during warm periods, there was actually not much going on. There's a lot of ground ice thaw, but most of that meltwater is moved down slope through rills. It's during intense rainfall events when we have substantial movements of material. So this, the blue trace here, shows you the indicator of the activity of the debris flow. During hot, dry periods, we have very little movement of materials away from the slump. But it's during intense rainfalls that the materials are rapidly moved away from the slump. And what we see in the, in the instrumented record from Fort McPherson is that f since the 1980s, the number of intense rainfall events has increased significantly. In 2010, we had uh, the two photos here. This is the picture of the slump that, uh, from the video that I was going to show at the beginning of the summer. And that is the slump at the end of the summer. There's been a net removal of materials from the slump over that wet summer. 2010 was the wettest summer on record. In essence, that slump became more youthful. It, the growth potential increased, as opposed to having the headwall being obscured by materials. Uh, that slump could continue to grow. And uh, again, concurrent with the removal of materials, uh, we had significant growth of the debris flow. The debris flow grew almost another half a kilometer down the valley during that summer. So just to reiterate, wet and warm 
climate seems to be very conducive to the removal of materials from the base of the headwall, which can allow a slump to continue to grow upslope. Cold and dry or wet and dry, uh, or warm and dry conditions are probably much more likely to lead to uh, this condition. And certainly, uh, the conditions in the last decade and a half or two decades have been particularly wet in the Peel Plateau. So what we wanted to do now is we wanted to sort of scale up. And people have done a lot of mapping of disturbances at a local scale, but we've never had sufficient quality of imagery over a broad spatial scale to look at the distribution of these types of phenomena that I'm talking to you about at a continental scale. And we were able to do that because of an online mapping tool created by the uh, GNWT Spatial Data Warehouse, or the GNWT Center for Geomatics. So this uh, site, you can, any of us can access. It functions much like Google Earth. We gridded the entire north of Canada, uh, northwest of Canada, so over 1.2 million kilometers. And we trained mappers to classify grid cells as to whether or not there were slumps on the grid cells, what the relative density of slumps were, and what type of environment those slumps were impacting. And this revealed some, so I'll just zoom you in here. The mapper would, one mapper might be doing Southern Banks Island. And you zoom in to grid cell BN77. And you'd see there's many, many thaw slumps along the stream valleys. And uh, you would say, well, the slump density is greater than 15 per, u per grid cell. The density is high. And uh, we have stream systems that are impacted. When we pool this data, uh, I th the results are actually quite surprising. We have, uh, like I said, about 1.2 million kilometers of grid cells that were classified. About 140,000 square kilometers of grid cells had impacts of thaw slumps. And once we actually overlaid uh, glacial limits on top of this, a beautiful pattern emerges. We see that the Wisconsin glacial maximum, uh, although it may not be as up to date as it could be, uh, essentially constrains the distribution of slumps. And when we put through other uh, ice front positions, so places where the, uh, where the uh, glacier was stationary for significant periods of time, a lot of the dots become connected. And then when we add in morainal systems, uh, that have been mapped uh, by the Geological Survey of Canada. Again, uh, they tend to pass right through these areas uh, impacted by slumping, suggesting that this ice core terrain has a very intimate association with um, moraineal deposits, suggesting, to me anyway, that a good portion of it is likely buried glacier ice. Far more extensive, uh, the ice core terrain, than I think what we might have previously thought. As I mentioned, we were mapping mostly large thaw slumps, and uh, the mappers were, were, didn't map uh, smaller features which could have, been, could have been ambiguously interpreted. I would also point out that when we look at change over time, each area we map, uh, the Peel Plateau, has a dramatic increase in, the, in slumping. The Mackenzie Delta region, a significant increase but more subtle. And uh, Eastern Banks Island, uh, absolutely uh, very, very different environment than it was in the 80s. OK, uh, I have a couple more slides and I'll wrap up, David. Um, what we were also able to do is look at the types of environments that, that slumps impact. And a lot of the literature focused on slumps on coastal systems. And intuitively, or I guess just because of the amount of publications in that, my assumption was that that's where most slumping occurred. But in reality, that coastal slumps occupied only probably about 15% of the total slumps that we mapped. Uh, lakeside slumping was actually much more widely distributed. And uh, fluvial or valley side slumping was also very, very uh, widely distributed, in this case occupying more than 100,000 square kilometers of, of terrain in northwestern Canada. Uh, I'd also point out that these landscapes are sediment sources for major <coughs> rivers. So even though the Peel River, uh, only about 25% of it flows through these moraineal deposits, these ice cored moraineal deposits, which are destabilizing, that is that constitutes the bulk of the sediment source for the Peel River. So just to wrap up, the distribution of near-surface ground ice is an important control on the environmental sensitivity of permafrost landscapes. That's, I think, no surprise to the permafrost folks, but uh, again, uh, something that I think we need to think about. The thawing of ice-rich permafrost is causing landscape changes, but the key is that not all landscapes are created equal. Some are much more susceptible to change than others. The degradation of ice core terrain can cause major changes in the behavior of streams and rivers, and I think that's something that's emerging. I think we can now confidently say that that's actually something that is of broad significance. It's not a local scale problem. And uh, the impacts are detectable in large river systems. And then finally, major slumping follows the pattern of moraine systems associated with the Wisconsin and glaciation. 
So I think that uh, the distribution of ice core terrain and, and what we're seeing, the sensitivity to this type of change is actually quite widespread. Uh, and landscapes that uh, really have that much ice in them, we can expect significant geomorphic modifications with climate warming. And then finally, this will take us into the rest of the conference. I think knowledge of permafrost is, is really fundamental to uh, informing what, our, what landscape responses will be to climate change, but also to uh, plan um, infrastructure and uh, look at mitigation measures. So with that, I want to thank you. I want to thank David for not giving me the hook after I was exceeded my time by four minutes. So. <laughs>